What you are watching is a demonstration of one of the first video games ever created, known as Tennis for Two. Video games have become a staple in the lives of many across the world. But how does this become this? Well, that's what we aim to discover as we journey through the history of video games. From the very beginning, through the Golden Ages, the Dark Ages, through all of our favorite gaming consoles, through all of our favorite games, and through all of the obscurity in video game history. Video game history is rich with interesting stories and interesting video games. My goal with this series is to touch on everything through video game history, and while we will still shine light on the stories behind Mario, Sonic, Halo, God of War, Last of Us, and Spider-Man, we will also touch on all the things that you may not know about that still influenced video game history. Video games have touched my life, and I have a huge amount of respect for history. So I decided to combine two of my passions into this docuseries. So welcome to Memory Card, the history of video games. And we begin right at the start, the beginnings of video games. This was the World's Fair in New York on the day of the opening. 300 buildings covering over 1,200 acres. It is the biggest international exposition ever conceived and carried out by man. It has cost $155 million, and all the states in the Union take part in it. 60 nations are represented. They expect to pass 60 million visitors through the gates before the fair closes. On the opening day, there was an estimated attendance of half a million. The fair was opened by President Roosevelt. I hereby dedicate the World's Fair, the New York World's Fair of 1939, and I declare it open to all mankind. The fascination with television technology began about April 30th, 1939, when visitors of the World's Fair in Queens, New York were mesmerized by screens showcasing President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who opened the fair. The 1939 New York World's Fair is both the entry point for the history of television and video games without really knowing it. This was also the first time United States President appeared on a television broadcast. Thomas T. Goldsmith Jr. was pioneering television technology during this time. The screens showcasing the President's broadcast were created by Goldsmith's boss, Alan B. Dumont. Although Dumont was an important figure on creating the foundation for televisions, this story is about Goldsmith. Goldsmith was born in Greenville, South Carolina on January 9, 1910. He was building crystal radio sets as a teenager. He went on to graduate from Furman University in 1931 and received a PhD in physics from Cornell in 1936. At some point, he teamed up with Essel Ray Mann to create the first video game, or at least what I consider to be the first video game. It's often debated. In 1947, the first video game was created. Although not a catchy name, the cathode ray tube amusement device is considered the first interactive electronic game. It was created by Thomas T. Goldsmith Jr. and Essel Ray Mann using analog electronics and cathode ray tubes. So to kind of attempt to describe what cathode ray tubes are, um, I'm hoping I pronounce every single one of these following words. But cathode ray tubes are described as vacuum tubes that produce images when its phosphorescent surface is struck by electron beams, and this is according to Britannica. They were originally used for oscilloscopes, I'm guessing that's how you pronounce that, uh, which were used to display electrical signals and how they change over time. Engineers often use these to measure electrical phenomena to test, verify, and debug circuit designs. 
The cathode ray tube amusement device is described as a game of skill in which a player sits or stands facing a cathode ray tube a CRT video screen mounted in a cabinet. Goldsmith and Mann designed the game to resemble a World War II radar display, but with airplanes or some other targets painted onto a transparent overlay, since this invention preceded the area of computer graphics. The game works by a player turning a control knob to position the CRT beam on the screen, which appears as a dot. This dot represents a reticle and is used to hover over airplanes until it overlaps, and by pressing a button, the player fires at the airplane. If the hit lands, the CRT beam defocuses to simulate an explosion. So not only was this the first ever video game, but it was also the first shooting game. For another staple in video game history, we have to go back to 1938 and look at the life of one Joseph Cates, who at the time was 17 years old when Nazi Germany invaded his hometown of Vienna. Cates fled to Italy and hid from the Nazis on the floor of a Venice gondola. He would write to popular mechanics that the experience turned me from a boy into a man. After Cates was sent away from England to Canada and had to stay in an internment camp per the policies at the time, he studied for a high school equivalency exam that ranked him a top student in all of Quebec. After being released from the camp, he moved to Toronto and worked on radar and radio tubes, optical components for periscopes, and gun sights. Eventually, he joined the University of Toronto's mathematics and physics program. Later on, Cates and Alfred Ratz led a team to build the University of Toronto electronic computer. It was among the first computers in the world. Cates would eventually invent the Adatron tube, which he said it was designed especially to do a binary addition all in one tiny tube, replacing a network of 10 interconnected ordinary radio tubes. A very revolutionary development at the time. Cates was also the creator of the next video game that we're going to talk about, named Birdie the Brain. The Canadian National Exhibition was the birthplace for Birdie the Brain in 1950. The game was essentially a giant tic-tac-toe game with the computer using binary notation to calculate its moves. It was said at the maximum difficulty Birdie could not be beaten. When someone lost to Birdie, the screen would light up Computer Brain Win and what was essentially the first game over screen. We had long lineups from day one, Kate says, of both visitors wanting to play and visitors just wanting to gawk. While Birdie the Brain was proving to be a difficult challenge in Canada, Nimrod was making its rounds in the United Kingdom. It was 1951, and the United Kingdom launched the Festival of Britain and John Bennett proposed having a computer at the Exhibition of Science in the festival for the British computer company Ferranti. This computer would be designed to play NIM. It's a parlor game where the goal is to be the last person to remove a match from a pile of matches. The idea for making a computer capable of doing this came from an electrical mechanical machine called Nimatron during the 1940s World's Fair in New York. The creation of Nimrod began on December 1, 1950 by Raymond Stuart Williams, who worked with Bennett's designs for the machine. It was April 12, 1951 that Nimrod was created. It was a 12-foot wide, 5-foot tall, and 9-foot deep beast of a machine. It made its public appearance on May 5, 1951, and although the public didn't really seem to care about the science behind the machine, they were really invested in playing the game. Most of the public were quite happy to gawk at the flashing lights and be impressed, said Bennett, which eerily echoes what Cates described with Birdie the Brain and the public's response to that. Another tic-tac-toe video game was created in 1952 by Alexander Sandy Douglas using the electronic delay storage automatic calculator. It was created as a part of Douglas's thesis for the University of Cambridge on human-computer interactions. The game was called OXO, or Knots and Crosses. Here's how the game is described by LifeWire. OXO is an electronic version of Tic-Tac-Toe called Knots and Crosses in the UK, and similar to the first electronic game, the Cathode Ray Tube Amusement Device in 1947, OXO's graphics were displayed on a Cathode Ray Tube connected to the EDSAC computer. Uh, the graphics consisted of large dots forming the crosshatches of the playing field as well as the O and X player graphics. 
The game pitted the player against the computer with the player as the X and the EDSAC as the O. Moves were made by the player selecting which square to occupy with an X by dialing its corresponding number via the EDSAC's telephone dial. The telephone dial was used as a keyboard to input numbers and directions into the computer. It wasn't until 1958 that the next documented video game was created, Tennis for Two. It was October 18, 1958, during the annual visitor days at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Visitors waited in line eagerly to play the electronic tennis game. It was created by nuclear physicist William Higginbotham. The idea for creating something so interactive was due to Higginbotham realizing how most science exhibits are the opposite of interactive or fun. Thus, he thought it might liven up the place to have a game that people could play and which would convey the message that our scientific endeavors have relevance for society, he said. The Brookhaven National Laboratory describes Tennis for Two as this. Visitors playing Tennis for Two saw a two-dimensional side view of a tennis court on the oscilloscope screen, which used a cathode ray tube similar to a black and white television tube. The ball was a brightly lit moving dot and left trails as it bounced to alternating sides of the net. Players served and volleyed using controllers with buttons and rotating dials to control the angle of an invisible tennis racket swing. Space War is another juggernaut in the early history of video games. It came about in 1962 created by Steve Russell using MIT's DEC PDP-1 mini computer to create a simulation of a dogfight in space, like something you'd see in Star Wars. Space War was a two-player game which controlled spaceships that launched torpedoes at each other while circling the sun which created a constant threat of being pulled into it thanks to gravity. It was amongst the most popular games across the world, and it was also amongst the first coin-operated games and inspired Nolan Bushnell to try and replicate its success with computer space. After that didn't quite succeed, he, well, went on to make a video game called Pong, and that whole story is going to come later. The 1960s then saw several different computer games being created, including 3D Tic-Tac-Toe that was created by the International Business Machines Corporation, IBM. Then there was Marienbad, and although there's not much information about it online, Wikipedia describes it as a 1962 Polish puzzle mainframe game. And uh, I'm going to try my best to uh, pronounce these names, um, so bear with me here. Um, it was created by Elro engineer Witold Podgorski, and it was created for the Audra 1003. Uh, it was also a game based on NIM, and was based on a discussion from the magazine, uh, this word, uh, due to the variant of NIM in the 1961 film last year at Marienbad. So from a certain point of view, you could argue that this was the first video game based on a movie. Um, I might not agree with that, but you could argue it. In 1967, Computer Quiz was made. Just a year before, Nutting Associates was formed by Bill Nutting, who created Computer Quiz, and it's essentially a trivia game which displays a trivia question and players have to pick from multiple choice options. There were four subjects to choose from, including entertainment, sports, general knowledge, and people and places. What makes Computer Quiz so unique is that it actually used film reels to project the questions onto the machine. The Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York was able to preserve the film from Computer Quiz and the machine still works as of September 3rd, 2021, when the Strong Museum posted the video going into the history of the game and the challenges of its preservation. I strongly recommend checking out that video as well as the museum, it's super cool stuff. In 1968, Hammurabi, a text-based video game, was released on the PDP-8 computer. It was developed by Doug Diamond and simulates land and resource management. If that sounds similar to games like SimCity and City Skylines, then it, it kind of is. The game is about managing grain production in a city, and the player has to manage planting, consumption, and stocking silos. 
One of the hostiles in the games were rats, which could attack the grain supply. In 1969, Lunar Lander was created for the DEC PDP-8 minicomputer by Jim Storer while a high school student at Lexington High School. After Storer watched the Apollo 11 moon landing, he went on to create the game to simulate it. It was a text-based simulation game, and the plot of the game states that the onboard computer has failed on the lander and the player must land it manually. Players would need to set the burn rates of the retro rockets to successfully land. Another space game was also launched in 1969 called Space Travel. This game was created by Ken Thompson and simulates traveling through the solar system. By having players fly a spaceship on a two-dimensional scale model, and there were no objectives other than landing on planets and moons. It kind of reminds me of if Space Engine had a grandfather. Other games released in the early days of video games include games like High Noon, which was a text-based adventure game pitting the player in a shootout against a villain named Black Bart. There was also Wida, or Awit, depending on your source of info, which was a chess game. But eventually, the Juggernaut of the Oregon Trail was released, which we'll talk about in depth in the next episode. And although I would love to go on to talk about the Oregon Trail, I think that is going to have to be dedicated to its own episode, just of how big it is. Um, so with that, that concludes this episode of Memory Card. This was really a lot of fun to work on and research on um, through all of my blunders and recording and whatnot. Um, to all of my sources, they are cited in the description. And after this outro, I highly encourage you to check out all of these sources read all these stories and watch all these videos to give them the love they deserve. Um, I could not have made this without any of them. Um, I'm just one guy with passion for video games and history. Um, I'm given the complicated nature and timeline of video game history. I'm sure uh, I will make mistakes. I probably made some in this video. So just let me know if I made any. Uh, provide some feedback. Uh, greatly appreciate just want to make this a, a great educational entertaining series um, so regardless I hope you found this interesting hope you learned something hope you uh, were entertained um, and I will see you next time to talk about the Oregon Trail <laughs>